Good morning, everyone. Welcome to West Heights. If you're out in the foyer, come on in and join us, grab a seat. Hi, everybody who's joining us online, welcome. And to those of you joining us from Forest Heights Long-Term Care, welcome as well. Why don't we begin our service together by standing um, and, and joining in, in some time of worship together. We're gonna start by singing Here For You. And it says, we welcome you with praise. We welcome you with praise. Almighty God of love, be welcome in this place. We know that God is here with us as God is always with us. So let's declare this morning that we are here to meet with God and welcome the almighty God of love into this place.
This next song says, your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. In Romans 8, 38 to 39, it reminds us of this. The Apostle Paul writes, I am sure that nothing can separate us from God's love, not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present or the future, and not power above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus, our Lord.
would rocks cry out to worship whose glory taught the stars to shine perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing but this joy
the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I God, thank you that you are a good, good father, and that that's who you are. We're just so honored to have a God that is so, so good to us. And thank you, Lord, that you, that you, that we are loved by you, and that that is who we are. Lord, help us to understand the depth of your love, to really feel and know how much you love us. Lord, we pray that you would just be with us now as we continue on in our service and the rest of our weeks. Thank you for meeting us here this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Lisa, and I'm here to bring forward our announcements for this week. So the first announcement is about a hike that will be happening today. There's several details so i have my cell phone with me to remind me of what all those details are 
So this is for our young adults. So, uh, so young adults uh, meet today at the church uh, between at 3 o'clock p.m. So this is happening August 14th today. Um, and I see Sarah is shaking her head no. <laughs> Sorry, not at the, at the church. Sorry, at the park. So this is going to be happening at Bechdel Park. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I missed that detail. So it's between 3 and 5 p.m. today. Again, our young adults. It's going to be a hike. So bring hike-appropriate things such as sunscreen. Um, you can bring a chair if you'd like, a lawn chair, a blanket. But also, there will be food served. So we do need to know this as soon as possible. So please RSVP as soon as you can. Um, and again, there's details on our website. So please go to the website to RSVP and also have those items with you if you will be attending today. Our next announcement is one that might bring a little trepidation. Next week, there will not be any coffee. But this presents itself an opportunity. <laughs> so if you are a coffee lover, please prepare. But an opportunity is here. So if you would like, you can join our coffee team and do send an email to office at westheights.org and you can join our coffee team so we won't have many of these instances where there won't be any coffee served. Sorry for the coffee lovers next week. And last but not least, so we're gonna end on a high note. We do have a little treat, special treat this afternoon after service. So please stay a little while, have a popsicle. I heard that they're like really high quality popsicles. So whatever that means, <laughs> if you wanna have one of those, please do stay. This presents another opportunity where you can sort of meet with other people that you've never spoken to and have a chit chat. So we would like you to stay and enjoy a popsicle after service. All right, so this uh, now ends our announcements and I can hand off to Josh. I'm afraid we may have oversold the popsicles. Now you're going to be thinking like, what are these popsicles? Well, I can tell you that if you don't eat the popsicles, my kids will. So please stay and eat the popsicles so that it's not just Silas and Isaac out there downing as many popsicles as we think, as we, as, the, as they can sneak from us. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be able to see everybody here this morning. Good morning to those who are watching at home or next door at Forest Heights. It's good to be together this morning, and thank you for the work to the worship team for leading us. Uh, there are themes in our worship set this morning that will uh, be picked up on in our uh, in our teaching time this morning, and so I'll leave it to you to kind of connect those dots. But there's some good themes there. Uh, as a local church here at West Heights Community Church, we are a part of a church family called the Be in Christ Church of Canada, which means that we are connected to the Meeting House. And as some of us are aware, over the last year, the Meeting House has been going through a difficult time as there have been allegations and substantiated allegations of abuse that have taken, and there's been investigations. And the reason why I'm bringing it up this morning is last night, the Meeting House released uh, the most recent results of the most recent investigation. And you may have seen that news poking up in various news sources online line already. And so that news is out there and people are chatting about it. And I got a couple emails this morning and I know that some folks that will hit hard. And so I just kind of want to put that out there as that's a part of who, of our church family, our broader church family. Now I recognize in saying this, and I'll leave you to go find the details and read the details of that report because that's not my news to share. But I realize in saying this, some folks here are like, so why are we talking about what happens at another church? Like, this sort of feels very removed from us. Well, that might be true for you, but I also want to acknowledge that in our church community, there are people that this is, this is hard for. That the Meeting House has been, you know, very important to our spiritual lives and has the ministry of the Meeting House has, has, has played an important role. And we have friends and family and people who are connected there. And so this news, this ongoing news is really just hard. And it sinks. And then there's others of us who, when we hear news like this, and that's been going on for a while now, it just makes us be like, man, like this should not happen at church, and this should not happen with Christian leaders. And that's right, too. And so I wanted to create a little bit of space this morning just to kind of uh, talk about it just briefly so that we can make space for some healing to happen, because when we don't talk about things, things kind of get pushed aside, and we feel like we can't have conversations, and maybe we shouldn't feel the way that we feel. And so I wanted to acknowledge that. And I also wanted to, to do this just as a way of practicing what it looks like to not ignore problems, what it, what, practice what it looks like to not sweep something underneath the rug and just kind of name the fact that there's something in our broader church family that sucks and it's not been a good situation 
and we want to make space in our prayer time to pray for the ministry of the Meeting House, for those who have been impacted by it, as well as other things that are going on in our lives and in the, the church community as a whole. And so we're also going to be praying for some of the churches in our neighborhood this morning, too. And it's just one way, is that one way that we can come alongside other followers of Jesus, other churches, and in doing so, we are expressing who we are as West Heights Community Church. We are not the church. We are a part of what God is doing in his broader church, and this is one way that we can be participating in this. And so I'd invite you to, to join me as we pray uh, this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the opportunity to worship and to hear the voices of other people singing alongside of us. Lord, that is encouraging for our souls, Lord. And thank you that you are the God who is love, who has loved us and continues to love us, even when we weren't sure, so sure about that. And so, Lord, we want to say thank you for our time of worship this morning and how you have been ministering to our hearts. Lord, we want to say thank you for the good things that we've experienced this week, for those moments of celebration, for those moments where we feel like we've accomplished something and we were able to use our gifts uh, to their fullest. You know, thank you for the, for the little things that got done this week that we didn't think would ever get done. And Lord, thank you for those small moments of joy and happiness where we found ourselves just smiling with a, with a pure joy. Lord, thank you for those moments. Lord, this morning as we've spoken, uh, we want to acknowledge the, the ongoing investigations and, and concerns that, uh, that, that have stemmed from the ministry of the Meeting House uh, and a, a couple staff people in particular. Lord, we talk about this with a heaviness of heart. And Lord, we are grieved by, by stories where people in power and people in authority have abused their power and caused injury and harm and abuse to others. And so Lord, a part of our prayer time this morning is just to enter into a place of grief and to say, God, this just stinks. We don't like this. We don't understand why things like this happen. But Lord, we also want to funnel our grief into going to you uh, with the things that are out of our control, the things that seem like they're too much, God, and, and laying them before you and saying, Lord, would you do what only you can do in this situation? And so, Lord, we are grateful for those people who have put their hands up and that they have, they have said something's not right. And so, Lord, we pray for those who have been victimized and we ask that in your time that healing and wholeness would happen. And Lord, that they would encounter you despite, you know, what, is, what has happened to them. Lord, that a good community of people would surround those who've been hurt and that real healing and wholeness would take place. Lord, we also pray for those in leadership at the, at the meeting house, Lord. You know, as they walk this difficult journey and, and no doubt haven't gotten it all right, but Lord, they're trying. And so I ask that you would give them wisdom and discernment to know how to navigate these hard things and to do so with a care for all those who are involved. Lord Jesus, we just ask for wisdom and that you would protect those in leadership and, and enable them to do what is right even when it's hard. Lord, for those who have been impacted by, you know, whose faith has been shaken by, by what has gone on over the last nine months, Lord, and that might include us, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen our faith, that, Lord, you would use this somehow in your grace as a part of a teachable moment where we would learn to rely more on you and to be looking to you to lead us and guide us. Lord, would these feelings of anger be at this news be, be turned to a cry for justice? And Lord, would we be a part of giving energy to see good and right change happen in their institutions and indeed in our society as a whole? Lord Jesus, we acknowledge this morning that we aren't the only church that matters. And thank goodness for that, God. But Lord, you are at work in a whole variety of churches, both here and around the world. And we are particularly grateful and want to pray for the churches that are at work in our neighborhood. God, we pray for the journey. We pray for Highview Community Church. We pray for St. Mark's and St. George's. 
or these are just the, uh, the churches that we know of that are right close to us that maybe we drive by or walk by on a regular basis. And so, Lord, we pray for the ministries and the leaders of each of these congregations that you would use them to represent Jesus well in this neighborhood, that together we would help people find and follow Jesus. Lord, we are not in competition, but Lord, we are co-laborers with these other communities. Lord, use us to do what only you can do in this neighborhood. Now, God, as we turn to our teaching time this morning, we just ask that you would just give us the ability to listen well to what you might want to say to us this morning. Help us to push aside those worries and anxieties, the things that are on our to-do list. Uh, Lord, just for the next 30 minutes, would you just help us to have ears only for you? And if I get to be a part of that this morning, Lord, that's awesome. But Lord, help us most importantly to hear your voice speaking to us. In your name we pray. Amen. So, uh, I would like to think that I'm a not, ju- a not judgy person, that I'm a non-judgmental person. But, in reality... I know I'm not, okay? In reality, I I come across different situations and people, somebody says something or does something, and I find myself thinking those thoughts. I don't say these out loud, but I find myself thinking those thoughts and be like, man, that guy's an idiot. Or like, I really can't believe that somebody would say or do or think that thing. And then in some cases, I might even just kind of wish that they just disappeared, Right? I find myself having these thoughts. And, and my attitude in those moments is that I am somehow better than those people, whoever those people might be. And the other person is less deserving of good things, certainly less deserving of my respect in those moments. And in some extremes, I might even wish that something bad might happen to them. Now, I know you guys are all too good to have those thoughts go through your mind, but some of you might be willing to say, yeah, maybe once in a while. There was a day about three years ago on Tuesday where I thought these thoughts. But maybe I, I think that we all can share this experience that sometimes we can be a bit judgier than we would like, and we would acknowledge that we shouldn't be as judgmental as we like. But other times, doesn't it feel justified? I mean, there are some people who have done some truly horrible things, aren't they? Maybe they've they've happened to us, or maybe they've happened to people that we love, or maybe we hold them responsible for some of the bad things that are happening in our world today. They've done some bad things. And those people, you know those people, we feel totally justified thinking that they are less deserving of good things, maybe even deserving something really bad happened to them, right? But the thing is, if we aren't careful, we can become so locked in to our judgments that we miss out on what God is doing. In fact, we can become so locked into our judgments uh, towards others that we might find ourselves actually angry with God that God doesn't look and see that person the same way that we see them, that God doesn't agree with us. And this is what happened to Jonah in the Old Testament. And the question that Jonah asked, or God asked Jonah in our passage today is about trying to get Jonah uh, to see beyond his judgments to how God might be looking at that very same situation. And so the big idea that we're exploring this morning is that God invites us to exchange our judgments, our judgments of others for his approach of love. And I think this is particularly important when it comes to those people that we think don't deserve good things. Now, this morning, we're going to be looking at Jonah chapter 4, and so I want to first summarize the first three chapters of Jonah, because I think it's kind of important. Um, Jonah is a prophet from the kingdom of Israel who is briefly mentioned, very briefly, in in 2 Kings chapter chapter 14, uh, verse 25. You can go find him there. Very brief mention of Jonah. And there, he is a part of what God is doing, and his ministry is about rebuilding Israel. In fact, his focus of of ministry seems to be about putting the people of Israel, his people first. And then as we get to the book that we know as Jonah, God calls him to do something completely different. God takes him away from being focused on his people and says, I want you to focus on these people that you think, you know, that you think of as your enemies. And the city that Jonah is called to go to is, the, is a place called Nineveh, which is an influential city. It was an influential city in the, in the nation of Assyria that's in modern day Iraq. And the Assyrians then were known for their brutality. They were brutal people. This is what they are known for. These were the bad guys of Jonah's time. And it was the people that, you know what? It was perfectly fine for you to hate. It was perfectly fine for you to wish that bad things would happen to those people. And despite this, God calls Jonah to go and invite them to repent and turn to God. 
you have to appreciate just how like foreign a, a request God is making to Jonah here. And this is where we get the story that we are most familiar with, right? Where Jonah says, I hear you, God, but I'm going to go that way. And Jonah runs away from God, and this is where they get the story about Jonah. He's on the boat. There's the storm. He gets thrown overboard. A big giant fish grabs him, swims up, throws him up on, throws him up on, I always vision him throwing the Jonah up on a beach for some reason. Throws Jonah up on a beach, and Jonah kind of like at that point is like, okay, I got swallowed by a fish. I guess I should go tell the people of Nineveh about God. He goes, and the people of Nineveh miraculously repent. And that's usually the story, that, that's usually where we end the story. At least that's the flannel graph version of the story. It works really well, but it's a nice, neat, tidy ending that, it, that makes everybody feel good. But in our text this morning, we're going to read the end of that story and about how Jonah's judgment, continued judgment of the people of Nineveh gets in the way of him appreciating what God has done and what God wants to do. And so we're going to look at uh, Jonah chapter 4, and we're going to reflect on three things as we read through Jonah chapter 4 this morning. And so let's, let's read the first three verses. But, jo- but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. It, it seemed wrong that the people of Nineveh would repent. It seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are gracious and compassionate, God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from ascending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. So the first thing we're going to observe from these verses here is uh, that through this story, we are invited to see how judgment, our judgment, can keep us from appreciating God's generous love. You know, as we read through uh, Jonah's response to the city of Nineveh turning to God, we might have thought, hey, this is a good moment. I mean, this is what prophets live for, right? You are a messenger from God. God sends you someplace to tell, you know, share his message in hopes that the people will listen. And that's exactly what happens to Jonah. And so you'd think that this was a moment to celebrate. But in fact, Jonah becomes angry, which tells us about how the, Jonah really felt about the people of Nineveh. See, Jonah so hated the people of Nineveh that he judged them unworthy of God's love. And not just unworthy, he wanted some disaster to strike them. But the thing is that Jonah knew that isn't who God is. That's not what God is about. In fact, his prayer is basically a tantrum because God did what Jonah knew that God was going to do. He was like, see, I told you so. You are too good. And then Jonah quotes a piece of scripture uh, from Exodus chapter 34 where God himself uh, tells Moses about who he is. This is my character. In Exodus 34, it says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. This is who God is. And Jonah knows this. And as a result, he isn't surprised that God acts the way that God acts towards the people of Nineveh, but he doesn't like it. In fact, his reaction is sort of what we saw from Elijah last week in our message last week where where, uh, Noah runs off and basically says, I want to die now, as if to say, if this is who you are, God, I don't want any part of it. You know, one of the things that this story illustrates for us is how our feelings about others can negatively impact our ability to to experience God's goodness. You know, when we allow things like bitterness and hatred or anger or resentment, even lust, if, if we allow these things to become a part of how we see other people, they can begin to control how we think about and how we experience God. See, instead of being open to God's influence, the these judgments start to call, can start to call the shots in our lives. The way we look at people change. People become objects to be used or, 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 or people to be beaten or enemies to be conquered. We can start to curate lists of people that we don't like, that we kind of wish something bad would happen to or at least nothing good would happen to them. And as a part of all that, the possibility that God's love and goodness might touch some of these people, well, that can become unthinkable. And so what can happen to us is that, like Jonah, we can close ourselves off from God's gift of his generous love so that we aren't willing to experience it because we don't quite like it. Now, as we reflect on this this morning, 
I wonder if we could each come up with a short list. You don't have to share the list, but a short list of people that, if we are honest, we might be resistant to, you know, the idea that God might love them and want good things for them. Maybe it's somebody who's, who's hurt us deeply or somebody who's hurt somebody that we love. Or maybe we find ourselves looking down at others because, well, you know, there, there are factors about them that we don't respect. Maybe it's their race. Maybe it's their education. Maybe it's their point of view, on, uh, uh, point of view that they hold. I mean, in reality right now, we are being conditioned to, to look at people who don't agree with our ideology, our, our perspective on the world, and to look at them as though they're the enemy. And so in our hearts, who are we judging as being unworthy of good things? Let's keep reading from Jonah. Verse 4. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. Have you ever witnessed a road rage incident? We got a fun picture for this one. Yeah, you ever w witnessed a road rage incident? You know, where you're driving along and there's somebody, maybe they aren't driving as well as they should, but then all of a sudden there's somebody else who an becomes an angry driver as a result, and there's gestures and there's words and there's some sort of erratic driving behavior as a result. And as a bystander, you're sitting back and you're watching and you're like, yeah, sure, that person was driving a little slow, but does it really warrant this response? Like, it seems a little bit out of, out of proportion here. And maybe you start wondering, like, I wonder what happened in that guy's life this morning that made him so angry that this slow driver caused him to do all this, you start to wonder why their response is out of proportion. You know, through this story, we are invited to reflect on our own out of proportion responses. And to get us thinking about this, God asked Jonah the same question twice. And the question is, is it right for you to be angry? Now, in asking this question, God is trying to prompt Jonah to think about his response and, you know, how he's thinking about and his thoughts towards the people of Nineveh and to try to think, Jonah, are you, are you really thinking properly here? Is, are you right to be feeling the things that you're feeling? Now, in asking this question, God is committed to Jonah, despite the fact that, that Jonah isn't on the same page of God. And you know what? That's, that's a good news story right there. God continues to be committed to Jonah, despite the fact that Jonah isn't behaving very well. And the question here is an invitation to rethink how Jonah is thinking about the people of Nineveh and God's generous gift of love towards them. But Jonah doesn't respond to God asking this question, at least not the first time. Because you know what? His anger just seems to be so much. He's so angry. Instead, the scene shifts, and we see Jonah camped outside a town, uh, waiting for God to change his mind. And because he, he kind of wants a front row seat to all the destruction that he's hoping God's going to bring. But in this place of simmering hatred, God continues to show his gracious love by sending a plant that would quickly grow and ease Jonah's discomfort. And Jonah's very happy about this plant. But just as quickly as this plant comes, it dies, and Jonah's sitting there sitting in the, hun, in the sun, and he's just hating every moment of it. And Jonah's happiness disappears. And once again, he's sitting there angry and bitter and full of rage, just wishing he was dead. Now, on the one hand, this plant, this plant is an expression of what we might call God's common grace. You know, Jonah is angry, and he's not on the same page with what God wants, what, who God is, and what God desires. And yet, God still gives Jonah something good to ease his, his suffering. Even if, by the way, Jonah's suffering is a little self-inflicted. I mean, who told Jonah he had to go sit there? Who told Jonah he had to stay there? You know, Jonah could have just gotten up and moved away. It was hot and whatever. Jonah didn't have to stay there. He put himself in that spot. And still God brings something to bring his grace and a little bit of relief to Jonah's condition. Now, on the other hand, this plant is a lesson that Jonah is experiencing. 
You know, God is inviting Jonah to examine what's going on in his heart. And at the core level of Jonah's heart is a rage that has been triggered by something small and insignificant. And his response, well, it's way out of proportion. You know what, you and I, just as human beings, we're going to have moments when our responses to life is just way out of proportion, aren't we? You know, uh, you know, one day, there we are, we're thinking everything's great, we can handle life just fine, and then something changes that's a little bit inconvenient, like, you know, the kids wake up and they're sick, or you go outside to go hop in your car and there's a flat tire. Two things that actually happened this week, by the way, okay? Uh, or, like, you know, your plans suddenly get canceled, or, you know, it just, life happens, and your response to that moment is to go from being everything's fine to just, life is terrible, it sucks, why does bad things happen to me? And, and you start, there's tears, and there's rage, Age and you start acting out in ways that is hurting the people around you, or maybe you find yourself going towards a habit that is really a crutch and is really not a good thing for you to be leaning on. You know, when we encounter our out of proportion responses, you know, where the response does not, you know, just it does not you know, relate to the problem. When our out of, we encounter our out of proportion responses, proportion responses, we need to ask ourselves what is really going on. Because nine times out of ten, the problem isn't really the flat tire, but something else that's going on in the background. For Jonah, the problem isn't that the plant died. Rather, the problem was the hatred and the bitterness that he had allowed to grow in his heart. This experience just brought that to the surface. All right, let's change gears, and we're going to talk about French fries for a moment. And when I put this picture up here, I have to put the disclaimer up that we have not been sponsored Although at McDonald's, if you're watching, I can give you the name of our treasurer. No. It's not even paying attention. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let's talk about French fries for a moment. You know, growing up, it was my understanding that there was one, there was one thing that you could dip your French fries in. Ketchup. That was, the, that was the thing you could put in. That was the only thing I ever saw people dip French fries in. And so... Until one day, I had my mind blown, because I went to McDonald's, again, not sponsored, but maybe open. No, we went to McDonald's, and a friend of mine said, hey, can I have a bunch of mayonnaise packets? And I was like, what are you doing? And then they proceeded to squeeze all this mayonnaise onto their, their tray, and then dip their french fries in it. And I was like, that is disgusting. That is terrible. Some of you are looking at me, you're like, that's the most wonderful thing in the world. And you know what? I discovered that. But up until that moment, I did not realize the joy of dipping mayonnaise, uh, your french fries in mayonnaise. Some of you are still like, that's gross, but that's okay. We will have the referendum on ketchup or mayonnaise another day. But hey, that's a ridiculously silly example, okay? Let's just name it. I'm a big fan of giving it a silly example, and let's just name that it's a, it's a silly example because what we're going to talk about is much more serious from that, about, than that. But in a weird way, it maybe reminds us or reminds me about how we can get stuck into old patterns. Maybe it's think, the only way that we ever knew things were, and we need the help of somebody else to show us I'm not going to say a better way. You might disagree with my, my, my example here, but we need somebody to show us a better way or an alternative way that we would have been oblivious to without somebody else's help. In a strange way, this is what we see happening to Jonah. Jonah is so walked into the way that he thinks and the way he feels about the people of Nineveh that there are no other options other than rage and hatred and bitterness. But through this story, God invites us to see that there is a better way to relate to others. And so let's read the final verses of, of Jonah here. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he says, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. It's the third time he wishes he was dead. He's a little wound up on this one. But the Lord sa said, You've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. And should, I, and should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who, ca who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? You know, God here, as he's speaking to, to Jonah, is inviting Jonah, you know, to rethink, why is he so angry? Why does he have this response that he has? And like the last time, you know, it's an invitation. That he's inviting Jonah to, to, to trade in his hatred for a concern and a love for the people of Nineveh, the same one that God is showing. And so as God speaks to, to Jonah, he points out just how much Jonah apparently cares about this plant. You care a lot about this plant, but did you notice that there's 120,000 people over there? Not a plant, people over there, Jonah. 
And, okay, if you can't care about the people, you seem to care a lot about, again, this plant, but what about the animals? Can you care about the animals that would perish if I did what you want me to do? Do you care about them? You know, Jonah has already noted that God is love, and here, the God who is love is inviting Jonah to acknowledge that his judgment, his anger, and his rage, well, they're not right, and to exchange it for something better, to exchange it, you know, for God's compassionate love and his heart for these people. And yeah, that would have been a really hard thing for Jonah to do. You know, years of bitterness and rage just don't disappear, but this was an opportunity for something to change. You know, to trade in his judgment and rage for God's love. You know, what what is interesting about the way that that the book of Jonah ends is that we don't know how Jonah responds to that last question. It kind of ends with God speaking. And I think that's kind of on purpose because it provides us an opportunity for us to enter into the story and to sort of say, if I were in Jonah's shoes, how would I have responded to what God just said here? And so this morning, I I want us to think about maybe those people that our default settings seem to be to judge. Maybe those people that in our heart of hearts, we kind of want, maybe kind of want bad things to happen to. Or those people that we're harboring a grudge against. Or the people who've wounded us and we want to see them pay for it. Or the people whose worldview we find so offensive that when we think about them or talk about them, we can't come up with anything nice to say. We really just dehumanize them in the way that we talk. Imagine God was speaking to us like he speaks to Jonah. What would he be saying to us this morning? You know, Jonah has already reminded us that God is gracious, that he is compassionate, that he is abounding in love, and Jesus embodies this this God who is love for us. And Jesus invites us to follow him and to allow God's love to transform our entire lives with one of the things that is being transformed is our attitude towards those who maybe we hold an animosity towards. Maybe those that we, have, we think it's okay of judging. And as we follow the way of Jesus, what happens in us is that God begins to reshape who we are. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. When we are open to what God wants to do in our lives, what the Spirit does is the Spirit takes this long view approach and exchanges those feelings of rage and, 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 and animosity and bitterness and, and exchanges it for good things like love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control and faithfulness. Now, let's acknowledge this isn't an easy switch to flip. You're not going to one day be like, okay, I'm going to be a less judgy person, or I'm going to release that, that hurt that I've been carrying for so long. That doesn't happen quickly. But this is something that, can, that God can do and will do in our lives if we are open to him. And so the better way that God offers us, the better way that Jesus offers us, is about this way of love. And it's really not just about us being nicer people. It really isn't. It's about us becoming more like God and in the process finding ourselves being freed from from things that that can really call the shots and and be corrosive to our lives. I mean, if we're honest, things like bitterness and anger and hatred and, and the feeling that we have to judge everybody and everything, that's really a heavy burden to carry and can lead us to some really dark places. It can lead us to some places that we're just not happy with our lives as a result. But God's invitation to Jonah and to us is to be free from these powers by saying yes to God's love. And so for some of us, it might mean that we say yes to God's love for the first time. Saying, God, I want that. I want to be freed from this, from this feeling of, of, of like, you know, judginess and, 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 and hatred and anger. I need to be freed from that. And, and we say yes to that by following Jesus and allowing him to become a part of our lives. Now, something that's interesting about the story of Jonah is Jonah would have said that he's already committed to God's way. I mean, he's a prophet, right? But the story ends with an invitation for him to repent and to choose a better way. And so for some of us, you know, we've followed Jesus for years. We would have called ourselves a Christian for years. And yet the reality is that if we are honest, that that judginess has crept in and has started to call the shots in our lives. And so like Jonah, we are invited to repent Acknowledge our judgmental attitudes and to turn and to say yes to God's way of love. And to say, God, I need your help, you know. I've been carrying all this around. It's becoming too much. 
I want to say yes to your way of love. I need your help having that become a part of who I am and taking over me in a good way. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for today. Lord, thank you for the songs that have reminded us about your love for us and how it never gives up, uh, it never fails, and Lord, how you know, it, it chases after us even. Lord, thank you that you are the God that is compassionate and gracious and, and, and is and determined to forgive. Lord, we, we need that to be a part of our lives. Because for some of us, for most of us, Lord, we carry the temptation to, to judge people as being worthy or unworthy. Or we, we are holding bitterness and anger and resentment towards others. Or we are, have chosen to see people as objects or, 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 or enemies to be beaten. And, and Lord, in our minds and in our hearts, there is a heaviness and a darkness that is starting to take over. And so, Lord, we ask this morning that your love would, would come the light of your love would come and would shine in on our lives and our hearts and the darkness would just scatter. Lord, if today we need to say yes to you for the first time, would you encourage us to do that? And Lord, for others of us, as we have been following you for years, may today be an opportunity for us to say yes to you all over again. They say, Lord, we want your love. We want to know your peace. We want your joy and your faithfulness, your self-control, your gentleness, and your goodness to become a part of our lives and to, to push out the things that are just not good and are controlling. Lord, we need your freedom. Lord, thank you for who you are and what you are doing. In your name we pray, amen. Well, thank you for, for joining us this morning. I just want to quickly say before we wrap up that the next couple Sundays, I'm not here. I am on vacation, but we have things figured out for you. Never fear. Uh, we have a, a couple years ago, I want to say 2019, summer 2019, we had a lovely couple come join us online, uh, Dave and Marie Patterson, and they started, Mary Patterson, and they started joining us online before they ever met us in person. We had a wonderful Zoom call, and they have been a part of our congregation ever since. And Dave has volunteered to speak for the next couple Sundays, and so we have an awesome opportunity to get to know Dave, and uh, Dave will be picking up on this series and has some good things. I'm excited for how Dave will lead our teaching time, so thank you very much, Dave. Anyways, folks, thank you so much. Don't forget your popsicles, and have a great week.